I figured since this is my first State of Vail Health, it would be most appropriate to start off with a little bit of an introduction. And I'm gonna spend more time than I normally would on a personal introduction, um, because I think it's important that you know me not only as the President and CEO of Vail Health, but as Will Cook, a community member here in the Valley. Um, <clears throat> I put this picture up here, Michael and I were planning the slide deck, and I did it for a few reasons. One, this is the last time you will ever see me in a coat and tie. <clears throat> Two, I don't know what I was thinking the day I picked that tie out. I think it was Christmas. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure there's Christmas themes in that tie. And I'm gonna be honest with you because I think that's the foundation of our relationship. My wife and I were sitting in my closet last night and I was trying on different outfits because it only took three weeks for me to want to grab a puffer jest every time I get ready for work. <clears throat> but I said to myself, and actually that means my wife said to me, you only get one shot at first impression, so babe, put the coat back on. <clears throat> so uh, I will tell you that I am adjusting, we are adjusting to the family uh, lifestyle here in the Valley. Um, as, of course, Michael mentioned, we moved here from Denver where I was at University of Colorado Hospital, but we very early on when we moved to Colorado decided, hey, let's take advantage of this wonderful opportunity to live in what undoubtedly is the best state in the union. And we went around to different places and we landed in the Vail Valley and in particular in Edwards. And so we've been coming up here with that terrible traffic for the past two years. And I will tell you in some almost sick demented way as we had to run back to Denver last weekend, it was our daughter's two -year, uh, second birthday and we had family flying into Denver. We came back Sunday night, and as we were driving west on 70, and I was looking at traffic that went all the way back to Copper Mountain, in some weird, evil way, I was like <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in all seriousness, I bring this up because we fell in love with the valley before we ever knew this job was available. And speaking of falling in love, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to introduce you to somebody who is by far the kindest, the most patient, the strongest, the most beautiful, and hopefully the most forgiving because she's also very humble and hates to be embarrassed, person that I know, my wife, Sarah Picone. <laughs> Cook, stand up. If I'm gonna go through it, you're gonna go through it. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Now, I know what most of you are thinking. I married up. <laughs> You're right, I married up. I, I, there's no argument there, I'm, I married up. The um, single most important thing to me in my life is my family. Um, and Sarah and I are at the core of that. Um, but you know, when we talk about presentations, a lot of people wanna ask me, well, what keeps you up at night? And typically they're thinking of things like, cost of healthcare, which I'm gonna talk about later, it's a real problem, behavioral health, and all of those things that are much more professionally oriented um, that again, we're gonna get into a little bit. But if you really wanna know what keeps me up at night, <laughs> uh, it's my oldest, and at this stage, this was this summer in Edwards, by the way, um, she was a year and a half at that stage, she's two years, she was the one that had the birthday Monday, we celebrated over the weekend, Sadie, and this is Sophia, her younger sister, who's now seven months. So I'll tell you a story about her when we start talking about the Family Birth Center here. But um, in all seriousness, what drew us to here and why I stand before you today, besides some of the, the extremely attractive reasons to pursue this professional opportunity, is that Sarah and I love being in the mountains. We love the valley, and we want to raise our family here. I've had so many people tell me about experiences of raising their kids here. And so hopefully um, we will be here for a long period of time and we'll have the opportunity to let our kids grow up in an environment that we feel is unparalleled. So that's who we are personally. Um, let's talk a little bit about Vail Health. Many of you already know this and so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on things, but some of you may not. And I bring this up because Vail Health has actually been around for 54 years serving Eagle County. And it still is fascinating to me that I'll meet people um, like Art Kelton, one of our board members, who tells me the story of how they were, you know, 
ski patrol and are you here? I don't want to get in trouble. I know he's here. Oh, there he is. And how, you know, really made relationships over time that led him down a pathway for real estate. And you talk about people, you know, like Jack Eck, who after serving in Vietnam came to the Valley and has been here um, when Vail Hospital truly was Vail Clinic because it was just a clinic of doctors. Um, you know, you hear stories from people like Andy Daly and others who have been wildly successful and instrumental in influencing the ski industry and the hospitality industry. Um, but if you look for a common denominator across all of them, they care deeply about the valley. And it was one of the things that drew me here was the opportunity to work with that board who wants to do the right thing by the valley. And I think we've got lots of impressive things that we've done to date and some opportunities to work on as we look uh, forward. So one of the things I really wanted to emphasize here as well is that we are independent and we desire to stay independent. Uh, I didn't leave the job that I had with a larger system on the front range to come here and then have us be acquired by someone in the front range. Um, that's not in my best interest and it's definitely not in the best interest of the Valley. And I say that because I've worked for one of those systems and they're wonderful systems. UC Health, Centura, SCL, Health One. But their playbook is to have a presence in the mountains and in many instances transfer as much as they can back to the front range. And I would argue that the people who had the foresight 54 years ago to create this hospital, they recognized early on that if it's going to be a living, thriving community, it needs hospital services and physician services to be local. And so that's a really important point um, for us as we talk about both our past, our present, and our future. 970 employees, 350 physicians and advanced providers. Again, pretty impressive stuff. I don't think people always understand just how long Vail Health has been here and how comprehensive it is. At the end of the day, though, in healthcare, your business is providing health. And so quality becomes our top priority always. And when you think about how Vail Health is done from that perspective, I put some statistics up here on the board to, to really underscore that point. We have a four-star rating with CMS, which is a fancy name for Medicare. University of Colorado Hospital had a two-star rating. That's where I came from. We got it up to three stars. And these stars come from measuring things like quality outcomes and the way you control infections and how do you not have people fall while they're in your hospital. This is outstanding. This is top 85th percentile, um, this hospital here in Vail with these four stars. Our breast cancer survivor rates are actually better by five percentage points than the national average. Prostate, even better, eight percentage points better. Um, so not only are these services available in the valley and prevent people from having to drive up and down 70 in that aforementioned traffic or even worse in terrible weather, the quality of the care is as good if not better. And I would argue that that is extremely important for the Valley. So again, I'm not gonna read through every single one of these. I really did it mostly to say to you that Vail Health is more than just this hospital. It's more than just Stedman Clinic Vail or Vail Summit Orthopedics or Howard Head, all wonderful things, world renowned things, but it's so much more. And I think that's an important component of how we try to keep people um, we try to provide uh, as much care as possible local and close to home. But let's talk about emergency care. Um, unfortunately, there will be times when there are emergencies. And while we hope that no one ever has that happen, when you do need the care, it's essential that you have the right resources here. So it starts with facilities. We have a level three trauma center, a beautiful hospital. We have a wonderful emergency physician team that works there in our ED. We have board certified physicians primarily in things like trauma, um, if you ever needed any sort of emergency surgery. Um, this is extremely important. Eight operating rooms, a cath lab in the event that you're having some event and they need to go in and do some type of procedure to remove a blockage. And if we can't do it, the ability to have a helicopter take you to the front range. I've met a lot of people in my short three and a half weeks here and I bet you I've heard 10 or so stories of folks who've had some sort of life-altering event 
that started somewhere here and then went into the hospital and they came out on the other side with a renewed sense of purpose in life. So having this asset and this emergency care is extremely important. Urgent care. I came from the front range where there was a lot of confusion around what's a freestanding ED, what's urgent care, what does it mean, it's a lot of money, why are you all doing this? Again, we'll talk about cost of care in a little bit. But I wanted to make sure you understand there's a big distinction between emergency care and urgent care. Urgent is not something that is emergent. And I know that that doesn't sound too helpful, but let me explain. This is a place where you go when you've got some sort of sore throat, you've got some other illness, you've got a sprain, something that you can't get into your primary care physician's office soon enough and you don't really need to go to an emergency department. We don't staff it with physicians, we staff it with physician assistants and nurse practitioners, and they're wonderful providers of care, by the way. Um, but it's a lower cost alternative to emergency care. And so when you see these things popping up across the valley and across the state and the country, that's why they're popping up. It's intended to be a lower cost alternative to emergency care for people who can't quite get in to see their primary care physicians. Now this one means something personally to me. Um, we have a level two nursery here, and level one, level two, level three, what does all that mean? Basically level two means we can provide care for, for babies and for moms who deliver at 32 weeks or greater. And that's very relevant because the gestation period, as you probably know better than I do, is somewhere between 38 and 40 weeks, depending. And this is vital because I'll share with you now our personal story. So Sarah and I were here for the weekend. Um, we actually were watching the Belmont Stakes and the Triple Crown, and we were jumping up and down and high-fiving. I'm not even sure that someone is supposed to be jumping up and down and high-fiving when they're that pregnant. Uh, I lost control. Um, I'm a sports freak. Um, but suffice it to say that she said, you know, I think I'm having contractions. And we got on the phone to our doctor at University of Colorado Hospital in Denver and told her what was going on. And she said, hey, Will, why don't you write down on a piece of paper when that contraction starts, how long it lasts, and then the time between that one and the next one. Do it for 30 minutes and call me back. Me, being very interval attentive, was you know, feverishly entering this information and ready to run some sort of linear regression analysis on it and call her back. Um, we called her back and we said, you know, hey doc, here's the results. Should we come to Denver? She's like, mm, no, you need to go to Vail Health. <laughs> So I remember driving down from where we were in Edwards and um, Sarah, who's tough as nails, um, not complaining, even though she was having significant contractions. We come into the ED, they whisk her up to the birth center. And I remember as I'm getting myself parked and coming upstairs, figuring out where she is, them saying as I'm walking in the room, she's four and a half centimeters dilated. And almost instinctively I said, we must have the epidural. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in all seriousness, the fact that there was a level two nursery in Vail Health Hospital when we were four weeks early on our pregnancy was the difference for us. And otherwise, we may have tried to leg it out to Denver. It could have happened in Loveland Pass. <laughs> um, and lastly, and I'm sure some of you can relate to this, it's way cooler to have Vail on your birth certificate than Aurora, Colorado. <laughs> we got that little pink hat. I may or may not have actually convinced someone to give me a second one. Um, so we experienced firsthand in June um, what it means to have advanced care close to home. We just didn't know at the time this was home. Cardiovascular center, again, I'll, I'll try to go through this a little bit quicker because many of you may know about this, but I feel like we should pause here because it's not common for a hospital of this size and a community of this size to have a cath lab in it. Cardiac catheterization lab, a place where they can come in and go in through your veins and actually for diagnostic purposes find out where you have blockages and then proactively get out in front of it either with a stent or some other intervention and or if you're having some episode and we think it's related to a blockage, they can go in and do the same thing. And again, I don't wanna say a bunch of names, but I've had so many people share stories with me about how in particular the cardiovascular services have helped. And I apologize for reading it. You know, three and a half weeks in, I'm, I'm still learning things, so forgive me, and I don't wanna get it wrong. But I will tell you that someone shared with me a story about Pete 
Roscovich. And if Pete, you're in the room, please tell me before I start telling this story. <laughs> I don't see Pete. Um, he was a 50-year-old snowboarding on a powder day with a local friend. I'm sure that sounds familiar to many of you. Long story short, he had a heart attack in the back bowls. 100% blockage, what some folks refer to probably inappropriately as a widow maker. Good Samaritans, an off-duty ER physician, found the patient and performed CPR on the scene. Ski Patrol responded quickly and provided defibrillation uh, shocks and administered cardiac drugs on the scene. You think about things like starting hearts and some of the stuff that they're doing out there now that enables us to do things on the spot, and it's another wonderful example of things that are happening in the community relative to this. But suffice it to say that Dr. Greenberg, who is the person here on my right, your left, um, with the glasses, is a very well-respected cardiologist who worked, used to work at Medical Center of, the Aurora, of Aurora and ultimately came out here to Vail. It just so happened that he happened to be out there skiing, heard the call, you can't make this up, ski patrol rushed him on the scene on a snowmobile. Um, bottom line on it all is we were able to get this patient to the cath lab, we were able to get things under control. It took an entire community of people, Good Samaritan skiers, ski patrol folks, uh, Dr. Greenberg coming into the hospital, having the cath lab. Um, Pete flew home a week after. Um, he made a full recovery. And um, this is the kind of thing that, from my perspective, speaks to the importance of having acute care services at the ready closer to home. So I want to talk to you a little bit about other surgeons, though, because so many people, I and mean, I was in this same boat, too, before I really fully understood Vail Health, thought of just orthopedic surgery. And don't get me wrong, we are so fortunate to have Stedman Clinic Vail and Vail Summit Orthopedics and Howard Head, and it just makes sense being at the base of Vail Mountain. Um, but we actually do more than orthopedics in the surgery realm. And we have four wonderful surgeons that do trauma surgery, all types of cancer surgery, laparoscopic surgery. Many of them are board certified, well trained. They have affiliation back with Denver Health, which as you know is one of the best trauma centers in the country. So I wanna make sure you understand that we are more than just orthopedics. And we have a bunch of different surgeons that are out there doing different things. Howard Head, again, this is another example of, you know, when I was looking at Vail Health from afar before I was ever thinking of it for a job, I always thought of Stedman Clinic. I always thought of VSO and I always thought of Howard Head. Um, but when I got here and I learned more about it and became to fully appreciate the fact that not only do we have these comprehensive sports performance services, but the Head family was so generous, both in terms of the support of the development of that program and in allowing us to use the name. And as a result of it, and for other reasons, we actually are the proud sponsor and medical provider of the US Ski and Snowboard Team and the USA Climbing Team. These are things that don't just happen at every other kind of hospital. Um, you know, when you think a bit about Vail Health, it's punching way above its weight class. Mayo, Hopkins, you name which ones you want to name. Ones I've worked at, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Hopkins, UC Health. They look up to this place when it comes to orthopedics and sports performance. That's hard to, to wrap your brain around given the size of the community and it doesn't happen without a community that recognized when they were trying to create said community that to do so we need a thriving hospital here. And there's been so many people who've played a, a small and in some instances large part in making that happen um, that I couldn't begin to call out all the names today but things like this don't just happen by happenstance. Oncology, cancer care, the Shaw family. If that's another thing that I've noticed when I'm here in the Valley, besides everyone being extremely friendly, they're also very giving. And when you think about, again, the, the scenario in which you've either directly or indirectly been touched by cancer and you get that diagnosis and you immediately don't know what you're gonna do, 
And then on the heels of that becomes, you need to have surgery, you're gonna to have to have chemotherapy infusions, you may have to have radiation oncology, you're not sure what it means in terms of your prospects for living or how that's gonna play out in your professional life or your personal life. You know, what if you don't live in or around this valley but you still don't wanna to go to Grand Junction or Denver? Um, what does that all mean? So when we talk about having oncology services here close to home, and having some of the providers that we have that are world renowned and access to clinical trials and 3D mammography in Jack's place, which is a place where people who need to be here day in and day out for these treatments can stay without spending any money. This is exceptional. It's impressive, I'm impressed. I've been a lot of places, worked a lot of places, and I'm extremely impressed, not only by the quality of the clinical programs that you heard me talk about before, but by the compassion that's provided the opportunity to stay in a place like Jack's Place. So it's really something we should be proud of. It would not be a Vail Health presentation if I did not mention the group that's up on this slide. Again, I will tell you that um, not only do they provide outstanding clinical care, they're on cutting edge, on the cutting edge in terms of research. Whether or not it's the Stebbin Philippon Research Institute, the Vail Summit Orthopedic Foundation, they're constantly looking for ways to find new ways to treat disease. And I'll take just a little bit of a tangent here to tell you that everything now is about big data. It's all about being able to process gobs and gobs of data at unbelievable speeds. And our ability to process that amount of data has resulted in breaking the genome code. code. So when you think about genotyping and you can actually find out from somebody what they're genetically predisposed to get in terms of disease state, and also find out that once they unfortunately do get that disease state, what are they more likely to respond to in terms of a treatment regimen? What does their body metabolize better? It changes the game of medicine, turns it on its side. And so when you think a little bit about um, what's going on outside of the operating room and back in the labs and what's happening with research and how we're trying to stay cutting edge, it really is all about how do we figure out ways that we get out in front of diseases? How do we genetically outmaneuver it? How do we have something called precision or personalized medicine that's based on your genotype? It's based on your predisposition for things. If you think about it, when you go to the doctor, besides them asking you how much you exercise and do you get a good night's sleep? Do you eat well? And are your lifestyle factors good? Allah, you don't smoke or something. The biggest question they want to know is, is that in your genetics? Did your mom have this cancer? Did your dad have that cancer? And so I have to tell you that some of the things that are going on now around immunotherapy and teaching your body how to turn back on its immune system, regenerative medicine, stem cells, these are the things of the future, and the future is not that far away. So when we talk about why do we want to invest in spry or research or anything of that nature, it's for that reason. And if we want these organizations that are you know, affiliated with Vail Health to continue to remain best in class and extremely relevant, they've got to do these things. So this is, without a doubt, um, a really impressive set of groups that have done some pretty amazing things. But again, it takes a village. And I will tell you one of the best things I discovered when I got here is Colorado Mountain Medical. There is a big group of providers. There's 20, I think it's 24 physicians and maybe eight or so APPs, advanced practice providers, the PAs and the NPs, that provide everyday care to people in this valley. Some of you probably know these names. I'll tell another story. First of all, again, it's, I feel so self-centered. I'm always talking about me, so forgive me. But I will tell you, Dr. Santa Maria was the one that delivered our child. <laughs> I will also tell you that while week one went exceptionally well, and we were high-fiving and saying, this is great, week two, Sadie got the flu. So Sarah calls me as I'm in a meeting. and is like, hey, I'm really worried. Her fever spiked pretty bad. I can't get it down, and I can't console her. What do you advise that I do? Now, initially I was like, well, go to urgent care. But then I called Brooks Bach, and if you don't know him, he's the CEO of Colorado Mountain Medical, and he said, no, 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 Will, I'll get you into C. Janet Engel right away. 
And within a couple of hours, Sarah was there, and you know we had not yet set up a pediatrician here, um, but immediately we said, not only was the quality of care good, the service was friendly, we actually liked it better than our pediatrician back in Denver. So this group is actually extremely important to healthcare in the Valley, and they're a very important partner of Vail Health as well, and I again want to make sure they get the recognition and the attention that they very much deserve. Mountain Family Health is another one. I think it used to have another name. Um, I apologize for not knowing it off the top of my health, off the top of my head. Um, this is a federally qualified health center. It's a designation that's given to clinics that oftentimes see a disproportionate share of underserved patients. It's an extremely important resource for this valley, especially since there are a lot of people who come here who um, meet that criteria. And I want to make sure you all know that while we don't own that group and it is a standalone group, we do provide hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in subsidy support for it because we know how vital it is to the people that it serves. And this is another crown jewel of the Valley. Now we're going to get to two really important topics. And I'll tell you that I will be here at the end of this presentation waiting to talk to anybody who wants to come talk to me about it. And in future versions of this, should they exist, and I say that because I'm not even sure yet how often these things happen or when, but I'd be happy to dive in deeper with you. I will tell you from a professional perspective what keeps me up at night. It's this issue. It's a national problem. It's a state problem, and it's even more acute in the mountains. I actually spent part of my career overseas living in Asia and Europe. And I was over there in large part because that's a socialized model. Everybody had insurance. You didn't have to have a job. You didn't have to pay premiums. You just had insurance. So from an access perspective, in one definition of access, everybody has access to health insurance and therefore then health care. Except for, they oftentimes had to ration it. Because if you think about the fact that health care in this country is pushing 20% GDP, 18% to be precise, and every other major developed nation is somewhere about half of that, the only way that they can give it to everybody, and it costs half as much, not the only way, a way, is they had to pay for it differently, and ration it. And I tell you all of this in part, ironically, actually, I was brought over there because they wanted to start to develop private markets because there was people who didn't want to wait two years to get their knee replacement surgery done. That's how they ration it. That's one of the ways they ration it. Um, the irony of it all is, though, is that whereas that was a socialized model that was trying to figure out private supplements to mitigate the things that didn't work with that model, America is a private model that's moving towards a socialized model. And whether or not that was the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, whatever you want to call it, or things that you're hearing about now like an all-payer system, like Medicaid for all or Medicare for all, it is going to come. We spend $3 trillion a year on health care. It's the most of any other place in the world. And so... If you say, well, how do I take those macro comments and make them apply to here in the Vale Valley? 2,400 businesses. Chris Romer gave me this statistic. Are you here, Chris? Chris gave this to me. I met with him yesterday. Outstanding person. He runs the Vale Valley Partnership, which Sarah is like the local Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> uh, 2,400 businesses. 80% of them have 10 employees or less. 90% of them have 20 employees or less. And so the bulk of our businesses here, as you all probably know better than me, are small businesses. And they already are dealing with the uphill climb of the seasonality of the nature of the business that's here and the difficulty in keeping people around when you don't have revenue coming in. They're already dealing with the housing problem which I still don't understand. Now healthcare 
is encroaching on those two big challenges as maybe now the number three, in some instances the number two, and in some instances the number one problem. And if you think about it, healthcare involves a lot of things. It's not just hospitals and doctors. We're a big piece of it. Hospitals account for ish, one third of every dollar that's spent on healthcare. We're the high end, high ticket thing, a knee surgery costing $40,000 and all the rest of that, right? But it's not just us. It's also the insurance companies. It's also the pharmaceutical companies. It's also others. And I'm not doing a finger pointing game here. I actually served on the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce Cost Coalition and Price Transparency Task Force. <laughs> That's not an acronym, don't try. And I actually really respected the fact that they brought together hospitals, doctors, insurance company, pharma, and members of the chamber because they recognized that we had to quit pointing fingers and we had to figure out what do we got to do to solve the problem. Now, there is no silver bullet, unfortunately. It's got to be a multifactorial approach to this. But I'll give you an example. If we say Vail Health and potentially other hospitals rates are too high, it costs too much for fill in the blank, right? So if I'm going to sit down with each of the payers and I've already reached out to them to schedule a meeting to do this, and we're gonna say, okay, let's talk about how we can lower our rates. If they don't in turn take those savings and lower the premiums, and also change the structure of the health insurance plan that they have, and to be more specific, I mean significantly reduce deductibles and do away with coinsurance, it won't manifest itself in savings to those employees of the 80% of the businesses have 10 employees or less. Because if you think about it, if you have to pay $2,000 a month for health insurance, which usually is not even remotely feasible if you're only making $40,000, $50,000 a year, and then that insurance has wrapped around it a $5,000 high deductible plan, you can't even use your insurance until you spend another five grand on top of the amount you're spending every month on an insurance premium. And then worse, if you do need knee surgery and it costs $40,000, and you have a 10% coinsurance, there's another four grand waiting on you. And I'm not saying that we don't own a part of that. We do. Remember the 40 grand for the knee surgery piece. What I'm telling you is we, and I say we deliberately, can only fix the problem if everybody has some give and take in it. And these are provocative things that I'm saying. And I'm scanning the room looking for my CFO who's probably ready to have a talk with me after this presentation. <laughs> but I know this is a real issue. I've read about it before I got here. I read about it even in the three weeks since I've been here. <clears throat> More importantly, I've experienced it firsthand, not just as someone working in the industry for 22 years, but going overseas and seeing the good and the bad of socialized medicine and the good and the bad of private medicine. And the answer is it's somewhere in the middle. But I will tell you, when I say we, I mean you too as patients. Because you too are going to have to figure out ways that you adjust your lifestyle, should you so choose, to also make health care truly health care and not sick care. Americans have been insulated from the cost of health care for many years and don't have a concept of what it means to not just take a pill or have a surgery the minute something goes wrong. So it'll take all of us, and we're on the forefront, and we should be, I'm just asking you to please be patient, to please get engaged in a constructive dialogue around how we fix the problem. And we have to fix it because if we don't, we're gonna find ourselves in a situation where we can't recruit people to live and work here in the mountains and that's not sustainable either. Just as an FYI, <clears throat> I'm having coffee, wait a minute, lunch on Saturday with uh, Representative Dylan Roberts where we're gonna talk about this. I'm having coffee the following Saturday with Senator, Senator Donovan, where we're going to talk about this. There's lots of legislation that's in the works. Tis the season. It's the legislative session. We've got a Democratic governor, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate. I'm not up here to talk D's and R's or left and right or any of that kind of stuff. It's a pathway to destruction. Um, but I am here to tell you, because it is all that, 
it will be easier for things to get legislated and enacted. And so this issue is real. And I can give you talking points left and right about how our average annual increases have only been two point something percent and health insurance premiums have been in the 20 percent. But that gets right back into the finger pointing and we're not going to get to the core of the problem. So I ask you, please be aware, engage in constructive dialogues and we'll talk more about it as we move on. <clears throat> I'm not even going to get into this um, beyond just saying Vail Health when it posts the amount of margin that we've posted recently, even if you back out that which, which was related to our investment portfolio, which I know probably many of you are watching your same 401As and 403Bs and everything was grand through September and then horrible last quarter of 18. But there is opportunity for us and we seize it at every, at every uh, possible way to take some of those margins and put them back in the community. And last year it was around $20 million. There still is more that we can and we should do. And part of that involves how do we take these margins and reinvest them back into things like aging infrastructure, which is part of the formerly West Wing renovation and now the East Wing renovation that is the 60-foot hole that's just on the other side of the Evergreen. Um, just a quick moment about that. The West Wing campus was completed back in 2017. You can see some of the things that were done there. The East Wing, which was needed to actually provide much needed support space for the West Wing and for growth in the outpatient area, where again, we can do things in a lower cost way. Um, this should be done in late 2020. Um, more to come on it, I have to tell you. I've never experienced the things that I've seen in three and a half weeks when trying to build something. There's like underground rivers and <laughs> you can't pour concrete under certain temperatures and it's snowing like crazy. I, I wonder how anything was ever built here on time and on budget. Um, the point is though, we're taking some of these margins and we're giving some of it back to the community. We're putting things back into infrastructure so that the Valley has this hospital for decades to come. But I want to talk to you about what really is the most concerning, the most um, sobering thing that Vail Health can and should be a backbone organization with um, when we think about the crisis that's happening in our country, our state, and in particular here in the mountain community. I don't even like to use words like the suicide belt. It's in quotations. And I'm going to share with you two brief articles. Um, not brief articles. I'm going to share with you briefly these two articles. It's hard to say out loud a river of lost souls runs through western Colorado. It's also hard to say the suicide clusters that threaten mountain towns. There's almost this paradise paradox that says, oh my gosh, I look across the room and somebody probably just came off the mountain to come to this lunch and may go right back up again. And there's all these really kind, friendly people and we just talked about how great it is to raise your family here. What do you mean there's a big problem with mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse? It is real. Colorado ranks fifth in the nation in suicide. The mountain community has way higher suicide rates than all of Colorado twice as many people committing suicide here as in New York City. These statistics, and forgive me, I don't mean to take what's otherwise been a fun lunch and put a downer on it, but I am trying to do a call to action here. If you look in Vail Health at the number of emergency rooms, sometimes you'll hear us say ED emergency department visits, 360% increase in three years from 2015. Alcohol intoxicated ER visits, 381% increase in four years. Suicide attempts. Is Chris here, Montero? Thought I saw you back there. I'm looking forward to having dinner with you, by the way. He'll tell you very directly, 172% increase in one year. 
324 phone calls come in for something related to someone who was having suicidal thoughts. That's almost one a day. The number of suicides in Eagle County, you see the jump from 16 to 17. These are just the ones that we can associate to suicide. Recall that there's an equally alarming number of people that are dying from overdoses that we can't say for certain it was tied to something that had psychosis associated with it, but clearly there's, in many instances, a tie there. And this is the one that even before I was a parent, and now that especially I am a parent, keeps me up at night. I'm going to talk through them. Almost a third of 7th and 8th graders said they feel sad or hopeless for two or more weeks at a time. Almost a quarter have seriously considered suicide on that green line there. This is the thing that I almost get teary-eyed saying it. 15% made a suicide plan. And almost 10% attempted suicide. We have a major healthcare crisis going on and it's manifesting itself, not just in our adults, but in children. And if we don't figure out a way that we band together as a community and get out in front of this, these statistics are gonna worsen. And that's a tragedy. And I will tell you, my first board meeting was my first day on the job. And on one hand, that was very daunting because I just, it was my first day on the job. <laughs> but when I left that board meeting, which had as a component of it, visitors from the outside, Chris was there from the ambulance division, talking about how emergency medicine professionals who are out there in the field are very well trained in how you do cardiac resuscitation. And while they know how to deal with diffusing very difficult situations that may involve mental health. That's not what they do. Law enforcement was there from the town of L, from Eagle County. Each of them stood up and told a story about how they're trained to protect and to serve. They're not necessarily trained to know how to best deal with a situation where someone's feeling suicidal or homicidal. But what they're forced to do, because they're there to protect, is to handcuff them put them in a car and incarcerate them. That's not a value judgment on our law enforcement officers. They are on the front lines. They are to be commended for trying to deal with an issue when they have, don't have the right tools to do it. <clears throat> Even in our own emergency department, if you come there, we have all these regulations and rules that require us to put you into a 72-hour hold. And you're, in essence, locked back into an area of our emergency department it's not the most appropriate place to deal with that situation. We need an appropriate milieu, an appropriate environment where you can take people who are having these sort of episodes and it actually calms them and it de-escalates it, not escalates it by putting them in the back of a police car. Again, that is not a judgment on our law enforcement. They are amazing. They have no choice. They have no place to take them. So I will tell you that I don't know exactly yet what it's going to look like. <clears throat> if you haven't met Chris Lindley yet from Eagle County, I think it's the Department of Public Health, if I'm not mistaken. Chris, am I wrong there? He's a rock star. He's infectious. You should talk to him. <laughs> He's actually working very closely with Doris Kirshner, who's my predecessor, who is also an amazing individual who cares deeply about fixing this problem. Our board unanimously voted to move forward with Vail Health serving as a backbone institution. We cannot solve this problem alone. The primary reason we've agreed to do that is twofold. One, if you put it in the government, I don't mean this disrespectfully to the government, you have to deal with the cyclical nature of people turning over in office. So as an example, one of our county commissioners, Jill Ryan, just took a job to be the head of CDPHE, right? And then whoever comes in and replaces folks, you have to worry, do they have different agendas? Also, as the only you know, healthcare provider in this area, we actually should be at the table. 
but we need to work with the schools. Chris went out and got funding for seven uh, school-based counselors. There's 17 schools in the Valley. We got 10 more to go because we need to be out on the forefront in our schools as well as in other places. So I have to tell you that I think that if we can come together as a community and figure out a way that we increase the number of psychiatrists that live in the Valley full time, and we figure out a way to have a crisis stabilization unit that's in an environment that is more conducive to treating those patients until we can do a comprehensive exam and understand do we need to send them somewhere east or west on 70. Um, I think if we also ultimately figure out ways that we in, not only embed these in schools but teach churches and other community organizations to identify it early on, see something, say something was created for a reason, but this is single-handedly the most important healthcare issue that we'll deal with. These are the folks that are involved. There's others that are not up here. I'm not gonna read through every one of those. Um, you know, there are some dollars that are out there. There's the 1A marijuana tax dollars. It's not enough. Inevitably, there won't be enough clinical revenue to cover the cost, and Vail Health will take a role in helping fill some of that gap. Some of these dollars will help fill that gap. Inevitably, there will be philanthropic dollars that come in because there's so many people that want to help. But again, you heard me talk about prevention, education, and awareness. An integrated facility like a crisis stabilization unit, <clears throat> all sorts of things that we need to be doing to inevitably try to figure out a way that we wrap our arms around this. And I'll end it with this. It's all about our mission. It's our compass. It's what guides us. I'm not gonna read this verbatim, but I think it's pretty intuitive to know that at Vail Health, we're here to provide superior health. And we wanna do it as an active member of the community. We know we have opportunity. We also know we've done a lot of very meaningful things for the Valley. And we look forward to continuing to do those things with you. And I look forward <laughs> to raising my family in the Valley. Thank you.